We've seen Netflix. We have the internet. We know that there are a lot of shows and things to watch on the internet these days. And, and perhaps not all of it is good, but there are some shows out there that are really thrilling. Like, there's good shows out there. And so you get, have you ever gotten caught up in a show where you're, you know, you're on the edge of your seat and everything is really exciting? You got your fingers in your mouth and your eyes are wide open. And then some big twist or some plot is revealed and you're just blown away. And then the screen goes black and you have to wait until the next episode. They, they do that so well, don't they? And for some of the kids in, in, the, in the service today, um, we used to have to wait a whole week to get our next episode. It's true. And so what, during that time, we would be discussing, we'd be thinking, we'd be, we'd be talking about this at work. And what do you think happened? What's going to happen next? And I think that feeling of just that suspense and just that waiting that takes place is what the gospel of Mark is trying to give us here. We know that he writes in a way that just everything's got to keep going. He keeps moving things forward. And so we've seen a lot of amazing things. Jesus comes on the scene. And he's just unlike anybody else that we have ever known in history. He claims to be the Son of God, the Messiah. He's claiming to forgive sins. And so the big question that everyone's wondering is, is Jesus the Son of God? Because if he is, it changes everything. And, And so as we look at this, there's responses. Mark is really big into the responses. Some love him, some hate him, some don't understand him, some are, there's so many different ones. And as we've seen in this plot, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper. So we hear that there's people out to get him. They want to kill him. And then we know that there's a betrayer in their midst. And then at the end of the last sermon that I preached last week, we saw that he was betrayed and he was arrested. And we're all wondering, what happens next? The question that has to be answered is, is Jesus the Son of God? Is he who he says he is? And this is the whole point of Mark's gospel. As we get to the end, we're still going to ask this question. And so we're, we're, we're pushed in a direction, but we're never told exactly who he is. We're told uh, what he did, and we're to see how this actually turns out in the end. So to find out what happens next, I want you to read with me in chapter 14, verses 53 to 72. Let's read. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about, their, even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Now I think as we look at this passage, we can kind of see two stories happening. 
And the way that Mark writes this gospel, I believe that he wants us to see that this, these two events are actually happening simultaneously. They're happening at the same time. If you look at verses 53 and 54, both of the stories are introduced at the same time there. And then it goes into the one and then the other. So as Jesus is brought to the courtroom, we're supposed to imagine Peter coming into the courtyard. And as the Sanhedrin is, is gathered together and they're all trying to condemn Jesus, they're prepared to do that. Peter is unprepared and he denies Christ. So this is the, the contrast here we need to see. We need to see how Jesus, what's happening to him and how he's responding, and then what's happening to Peter and how he is responding. And what we're meant to see, and, and I believe what we're meant to feel as we read this, is that in the moments that Peter is being unfaithful, Jesus is being faithful. That what we need because of our own desperate, disappointing denials in our lives is Jesus, one who stays faithful to his Father's plan, and to those he came to save. And so let's look at these divinely inspired words of the author and discover how he communicates grace to all of us who have struggled, who have succumbed to the temptation to be unfaithful in this world. So verse 53 tells us that the Sanhedrin, the religious council of the day, they came together. Now this group was made up of those that are mentioned there. It says the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now these were considered the most godly people in Jerusalem. They were put together so that when laws are broken, they would become the court. They would be the judge, the jury of what is what needs to happen. So the judgments were made and they were considered the most godly people so that justice would prevail. And in Deuteronomy chapter 16, God prescribes what they are to do. That his people were to appoint judges and officers and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice, God says. You shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe. So this is great if they would have obeyed this. Because at the time, well, like anyone else, the sinless Son of God should have had a fair trial. But every single one of these people on the Sanhedrin are corrupt. They're wicked men. They're not godly. They're not seeking justice. In the first century, this was the case. And in verse 55, it makes it crystal clear that this was not a truth-seeking mission. It was a lynch mob. It says, now the chief priest and the whole council, I believe that's literal there, the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. So Mark, Mark's painting the picture that Jesus is completely alone here. He stands against the world, against this, this Sanhedrin, against everyone else. All the disciples have fled, and he is on his own. And as he stands before these 71 most influential Jews at that time, he's left to be by himself. And these religious leaders had already condemned him to death. That's what we see here. All that they need now is a reason to have him executed a reason to take him to Pilate, who had the power to execute a, a, a criminal. The Jews didn't have that power. They needed a reason that would at least appease Pilate so that he would execute him so that they could take, uh, carry out this satanic strategy. And unfortunately for them, this was going to be harder than they thought because verse 55 says, they were seeking testimony, yet they found none. Now, during the interrogation, which was in an upper room, there was a courtyard below, and that's where Peter was. And so Peter is nearby, but he's, he had fled after the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He hasn't deserted Jesus altogether, at least not yet. And what we see him, how he's described, even the way that he's following Jesus, shows it conveys denial. Look at what it says about him. In verse 54, it says, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. Now, Peter's been following Jesus for years, but not at a distance. He's been up close, right with Jesus, even sometimes ahead of Jesus. And so what we see here is that he's denying Jesus in the way that he follows. He's not standing with Jesus anymore. He denies him his presence. He denies him his support. He's outside down below. And it also says that he was with the guards, indeed the ones who seized him in the garden. He's sitting with them. It says he's sitting and warming himself at the fire. 
And these details show us that he's seeking his own comfort and, and getting warm in this cold night while Jesus is enduring the cold condemnation of a crazed crowd. Now, I want to stop here for a moment and just look at this contrast. We're going to do this a few times here. What, what Jesus is going through and what Peter is going through at the very same moment. And the, the differences are horrendous. See, Jesus is submitting himself to the greatest miscarriage of justice ever. And Peter is down below, warming himself, trying to stay comfortable. Jesus, the result is going to be that he's going to be condemned to death. And he is the one sinless person that this world has ever known that doesn't deserve to die. And yet he's going to be killed. And what we see in Peter at this moment is ourselves. That's what we need to see. We are disciples like Peter, and we desert Christ. We deny Christ in the way that we live, in the way that we follow. And what we need to see here is ourselves, that we have been unfaithful. We have been unworthy before God. And then Jesus comes, and what he goes through is exactly what we need. He is our steadfast Savior when we have been unworthy and unfaithful. He gives us, and he stands faithful, he stands worthy exactly in the place that we cannot. And so what we're meant to see here is that Jesus does for us, in our place, what we cannot do for ourselves. Now from the courtyard, Peter may have been able to listen to these accusations that are being shouted from this mob at Jesus, but he stays quiet. In verse 56 it informs us that there was a plethora of testimonies against Jesus that came forward. And Mark doesn't tell us who it was that was speaking. Was it the Sanhedrin? Was it the, own, was it the jury that was out to get him? Was it people that had been dragged into this midnight mockery that are adding to these accusations? Were they told? Were they given a script of what to say? Mark doesn't tell us. And at this point, it doesn't matter. All they need to know or find out is an accusation that they could kill him for. What were they saying? That he healed lepers? That, that, he, that he healed on the Sabbath? That he disagreed with some of their traditions? That he hung out with tax collectors and sinners? That he cleared the temple? What is it that he's trying, that they're trying to accuse him of? And I think it's a whole bunch of different things. And the Sanhedrin, this jury, is just waiting and listening and looking for a reason that they could put him to death. That's all they wanted. But the problem was that verse 56 tells us that their testimony did not agree. And the law required the testimony of two people to be the same if a death warrant was going to be issued. So they were failing at their mission right now. They, they cannot find two testimonies that are alike. And then in verse 57, it begins a specific accusation. We've heard that there's been accusations. Now he gives us an example. And this could be one that they could kill him for. This is what it says in verse 58. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. So Mark gives us the specifics here, and this was serious, because the temple was the place where God dwelt. This was the most holy of places, and to come against the temple, to come and destroy the temple or say you're going to, was worth a capital offense. This was coming against God himself, and they could put someone to death for this. And you probably remember that Jesus said something like this, but not exactly. Because in John chapter 2, Jesus said something similar, but he was actually not referring to the physical temple. It says in John chapter 2, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. So the crime that they're thinking this could, this could get him wasn't actually what he intended to do or to say. And so you can imagine the high priest here. He is the judge in this courtroom, and his eyebrows are lifting, and he's thinking, is this, can we get him here? And then, verse 59 reports, yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. So far, Jesus hasn't said a word. He, he stands there silent. He's surrounded by liars. And, and even though there's no sin that they can legitimately convict him of, they are trying. They're trying with everything they've got, and he allows this. Jesus, God himself, allows this to transpire right in front of him. And as the Son of God, before this moment, he knew. In eternity past, he had known and seen this scene 
that he had to endure when he took on flesh. He knew this was coming. He knew this would happen. And now that he's taken on flesh, he's now beginning to feel the weakness of flesh. And he's tempted to the edge, uh, to the point of breaking, and his flesh within himself is now feeling the sting of a defiled reputation. He's feeling the abandonment of all of his disciples, this loneliness, and he's feeling that impulse to, to respond, to retaliate, and to defend his own reputation. Yet, he's found faithful through it all. He stands there and he takes it, and his faithfulness stands in stark contrast to Peter's, doesn't it? We've seen at the, that the top 71 most influential Jews are interrogating Jesus with the, with the purpose of putting him to death. So that's what's going on upstairs. What's going on in the courtroom? In verse 66, it introduces Peter's trial. And this is a comparison here. We're supposed to see how different they are. He didn't face the high priest. He faced the maidservant of the high priest. He didn't have people coming at him uh, 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 with swords and, and clubs to arrest him and to be betrayed. Peter here is just... It ha he happened to be noticed by a girl in the light of the fire. He didn't face an onslaught of rapid-fire accusations which were false. All Peter faced was a true comment about himself. All she said was, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. And it's that name there that Peter says, I would be associated with any other Nazarene in this moment, but not Jesus. Not now. And so he plays dumb. You see it in his, in his answer. He basically says, uh, what are you talking about? I, I don't understand you. And he basically wants the, 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 the questions to stop. He, he doesn't want to talk about this. He just wants to be close. He wants to find out how things go. He doesn't want to be seen. He doesn't want to be known. He does not want to be associated with Jesus at, at this moment. But this, as small as it might seem in his answer, it doesn't seem like he's denying, but he is. He is. He did know what she meant. He did understand what she meant, and he denied it. And it says here that he went out into the gateway. And that shows us that he's even distancing himself further from where he was behind Jesus. He followed at a distance, and now he's moving away with his words and his actions. And this is just the first time of three times. Now, I want to stop here and and look at Jesus again, and look at Peter. Consider Jesus. He is completely innocent. And you'd think that this courtroom, with all of these people accusing him, could find one thing that he broke in God's laws, even just the smallest thing, and yet it continues to show us that Christ is sinless. Not even in the small things did Christ take any sort of shortcuts. This is what is highlighted here. Their testimonies did not agree. It says they could not find any testimony against him. And so his death here, which is the result of all of this, his death was not a result of his own sin. He was sinless. His death was a result of other people's sins. He was perfectly obedient to God in such a way that, incredibly, there was nothing that they could use against him. He was not a candidate for crucifixion. In fact, he deserves to be worshipped. And then you look at Peter and see what he is going through. And, and what we see in Peter is ourselves. What he's going through is not persecution in comparison to what Jesus is going through. He felt persecuted, but he's so weak that he's quick to deny Christ so quickly. Any association with Jesus will not do. He needs to remove himself completely especially when it's a negative thing. Peter always spoke up when he thought he was going to be good for him. And in this case, he knows it's going to go bad, and so he denies Christ. And none of us in this room, no one has a, perfect, a perfectly faithful record to Christ. And yes, we all desire to be faithful, but we are not. There are times in our lives where on Sunday we are boasting in the cross of Christ. We love the cross of Christ. We know that that's our salvation. And then on Monday at work, we're asked questions. What'd you do on Sunday? Tell me more about this dead Messiah that you worship. And we sometimes play dumb, thinking that the cross is too scandalous. We don't want to be associated with Jesus. 
so that the questions will stop. And we are all guilty. And what I see here as the first point is that Jesus is innocent. We need to see that because we are guilty. Peter is guilty here of denial. But we know we're all guilty of sin. And that Jesus, when he goes to his death, had to be sinless. And so when he walks through the door that these, these, this courtroom offers, it's not because he's going to sin so that they put him to death. It's so that he stays faithful and true and sinless. And he has to go and die for those who have sinned. And we've all denied Christ, even in seemingly small ways. But we've all done this. We've all distanced ourselves away from Jesus in certain scenarios. Whether it's at the baseball diamond, whether it's at the coffee shop, or even at our family gatherings or at work, you and I have failed Christ before. But Christ has never failed you. And that's the contrast we need to see here. Now back in the courtroom above, the jury's getting nowhere. They, they've tried. They've convened under the, the convenience of night so that the crowds that have been captivated by Jesus, that they don't know what's going on. But this is taking too long. They have no testimony against him. There's witness after witness and testimony after testimony, and nothing's working. And so to get some movement, all they needed was one reason, one religious reason to put him to death. And so the movement now comes by the high priest himself. He starts speaking up, and it says in verse 60, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is this? What is it that these men testify against you? Now you have to imagine the courtroom here. You have to see that the high priest is the judge. So imagine a courtroom. The judge sits in the middle, right? There's a jury on the side. Jesus is on the stand. People are prosecuting him. The judge is only supposed to facilitate the whole thing. But here he's standing up and looking at Jesus and saying, you need to answer what is it that these false testimonies are coming at you about? And all he wants Jesus to do is to talk. He says, as long as he's silent, there's nothing we can convict him of. We need him to talk. And so he gets up in the moment that Christ has been proved sinless. Christ, there's nothing against him. When the judge should be saying, innocent, and allowing him to go free from custody, the judge instead turns to Jesus and says, and, and starts prosecuting him. And he wants him to speak up. But Jesus knows that none of these, none of these are, are an evidence against him. There is nothing that he needs to speak about. His goal is to get Jesus to say something that will incriminate him. There's been no evidence of guilt. He's perfectly sinless. And so the high priest asks him a question. A specific question. That if Jesus were to say yes to it, or answer positively, it could be construed as blasphemy. And if any one of us were on the stand and we answered yes to being the Son of God, we would all be condemned as blasphemers. But when Jesus speaks up, he is still telling the truth. Look at verse, verse 61. It says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And if you look at the Greek, the way that they, they actually switch two words, the, the are you to you are. So it is a question but what the judge is trying to do is say, you are the son, or the, the Christ, the son of the blessed. He's accusing him of that. So if Jesus doesn't say no, if he doesn't answer, they can still use that against him. But when you read it in Greek, you see that he's making a true statement. You are the Christ, the son of the blessed. Up until this point, no one else has recognized this. And now the chief priest the high priest, the judge of this ruling, is going to declare the truth about Jesus. Finally, some truth in this trial. Finally, something that Jesus can actually admit to doing or to being. And so when Jesus responds, he uses the covenant name of God. And he says in verse 62, I am. And they look at him. They don't see the Messiah, that triumphant king that they expected him to be. And so they condemn him. They say, no, you're not. And Jesus is claiming to be divine here with all authority and all power and all glory. This is what he's saying. And they didn't get it wrong because look at what he says next. It's intentional. He says this, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
So Jesus refers to these messianic passages in Daniel 7 and in Psalm 110 to show that he is who he says he is. He says, I'm that person. I am God's anointed. I will be, I, I am God. And in essence, what he's telling them in this situation is, is ironic because what he's saying is, right now in this moment, you are judging me. But there will come a day when I will come and you will be judged by me as God. In this upper room, Jesus has been quiet. He hasn't said a lot, but he has said enough. And when he's confronted, he is completely faithful to who he is. But in the courtyard below, Peter is loud. He talks a lot here. And when he's confronted, he's not faithful. He, he is unfaithful. And verse 69 tells us that the servant girl didn't let this go. And she starts talking to other people, the, the, the bystanders there. And, and she says, this man is one of them. And again, a true statement. Jesus is getting all these lies, and Peter's getting all these true statements, and yet again he denies it. This time, the author uses a, gr a Greek word that implies that he did this continuously. So again, he's, he's doing this all the time. So whether more people asked him the same question or whether he just felt judged by their glares, he kept saying, I don't know, I'm not one of them, I don't know this man. And he did this over and over again. And so what we see here is that his denial is intensifying. But it's interesting that verse 70 continues, and after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Now they figured out that he's from Galilee, and it's not because of what he looked like. It's because he's talking and talking and denying and denying and they're, see, or they're hearing his accent. And the way that he's talking is actually betraying him. They're saying, he's from Galilee. Of course he's one of them. You've got to be one of them. And again, Peter denies this. And he's backed into a corner and he starts to show his teeth, right? And he's barking out his third denial. It says in verse 71, but he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man of whom you speak. He won't even name Jesus. So let's look at Jesus now in comparison to Peter. He, he's completely faithful. And when falsely accused, he kept his mouth shut. And when forced to answer a true question or to, to, to tell the truth, even though it threatens his life, he's faithful. He speaks the truth. Why? Why did he say it? He knew that this was going to get him killed. If he was continuing to be silent, he might have gotten out of it. But he spoke up, and he intentionally walked right into their trap. He was determined to die, to be the faithful one in the place where we have been unfaithful. He's not just faithful in speaking the truth and saying, answering questions that yes or no or whatever it is. He's faithful to his father's plan. As, as much as it cost him. He's faithful to you and me, to the sinners that he came to save. And he had to be faithful. He had to be sinless. And there, in, in this passage, we see that he was. He was determined to die to save us, and he couldn't be sinful when he died. And so when he is executed, the reason why he gets killed is for telling the truth. And he did it for us. And then there's Peter. And we are like Peter, that when we are confronted with being one of his disciples, we can get uneasy. People have their opinions about Jesus and the church and Christianity, and we don't like to be called those names or those labels or referred to like that. Even the way that we see the accusation or just the, the questions asked in this passage, are you one of them? And he doesn't want to be one of them. And oftentimes, we don't want to be one of them in association with Jesus. And so we give way to pride and we distance ourselves away from Christ so that people will just leave it alone. And they don't label us. We don't like those labels. We don't like those glares that they might give us. We just don't like being pushed away just because we're Christians, especially with those that we are close with. But none of us, again, have remained faithful completely faithful to Christ in this world. Not the way that we should. And so when the moment had come and Jesus sees that he needs to die, but he can't do it because of sin, 
he walks right through the door that they've opened for him. He knew it would condemn him, and he does it. Not because he lied, but because he told the truth. And that's what he needed to do. No matter what it costs, he's faithful. He, he's faithful, no matter what it costs. And it cost him his life. He is faithful to us in our unfaithfulness. And again, we see how this is happening at the very same time. Peter is denying while Jesus is faithful. This is the Savior that we need. And he earns our forgiveness And he makes us faithful in God's sight. And this is the good news. That while we are finding ways to save our reputation, that we are finding ways to avoid persecution, he's walking right into them to endure them for us. And so the second thing that I see here is that Jesus is faithful because we are unfaithful. So Peter tries to save his life by being unfaithful. At the same time that Jesus loses his life, Because he is faithful. And verse 64 says, And they all condemned him as deserving death. Jesus didn't say much, but when he did speak, he spoke absolutely true things. They labeled him a liar. They called him a blasphemer. By their unbelief, they were blinded, and they did not see him as he truly is. They called him a criminal. And they had enough. They had the ticket in their hand now to take him to Pilate to execute him but not without treating him with unrelenting contempt first. Listen to how sick verse 65 really is. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And when the guards returned, no doubt the ones that Peter had just been sitting with down below, even they received him with many blows. Meanwhile, Peter has heard the rooster crow the second time, and he realizes that his denial, the very thing that he refused to believe would ever happen, has taken place exactly as Jesus told him it would. And it says that he, in verse 72, broke down and wept. Again, look at Jesus. He's absolutely faithful. God humbles himself by taking on human nature, And he submits, we know, to death, but he even submitted to the feeling of being spit on his face. This is the the humiliation that he bore for us. This is the treatment that all of us deserve because of our sin. And yet Jesus comes to bear this for us. And he doesn't retaliate. He tells the truth about who he is, and then they mock him, and they reject him. Even the guards who may have just been there doing their job that night, they join in in the beatings of this innocent man. Why would Jesus willingly allow himself to go through this? Why would he come for this very reason? But it's because he created us and he loves us and he knows how far sin has reached within our hearts, how deep those roots go and how much we will seek our own preservation instead of being faithful to Christ. And so he came to earn the forgiveness for you. He became the substitute to die in our place. And then we look at Peter, and there's us again. That that we see, if we take the time to recognize the, the, the record of faithfulness of our own to Christ, it's miserable. We know that we break down at times and we weep at the realization of how deep our our wretchedness really goes. And we repent with all of our heart and we know and we confess that we are too weak to do this on our own. But at the same time as we deny Christ in our actions, in our thoughts, in our words... At the very same time, we see that Peter is doing this, Jesus is going and paying for all of these things. He's being despised in our place. He's being rejected in our place for yours and for mine. And so the third thing I see here is that Jesus is humiliated because we are so proud. So do you see your need for a Savior? Do you see how miserable our faithfulness to Christ is and how great His faithfulness is. 
Do you see how sinful we are and how, how innocent he is? Do you see how much love Jesus has for you? That in the place where you deserve to go, to the cross, for your treachery, he goes and bears the punishment in our place so that we can have forgiveness, so that we can be welcomed into eternal blessings. He dies for our sins. He he dies for our shame. He dies for our fear and our condemnation. And he does this all in our place as our innocent and faithful Savior. And as much as the cross is scandalous to those who don't understand it, to those who don't believe it, who have no faith in Christ, this is the ground of our salvation. Everything rests on him getting to the cross and going through it. And when we see the contrast between what we deserve and who we are and what Christ deserves and, what, and who he is, we see that this is completely flipped and we see how Christ is a substitute in our place. And so if you believe this good news today, put your faith in Christ, your substitute, your Savior, and your Lord. To whatever degree that you've denied Christ before, Peter's example shows us that God's grace overflows to sinners, to those who have denied him. And Peter seems to have gone further than all of us. And yet we've all done this, and there is grace. And this is why Christ came to die. And if you believe this, that Christ died in your place to to pay off all of your sins, then you too will be forgiven through his death. And you will be given eternal life through Him. He paid for our unfaithfulness. And that's why Jesus is determined to die. To save everyone. Everyone who will trust in His work that He did on the cross for them. And the Lord, we must see here, is gracious and good to all. And and has compassion on all that He has made. And today, He is calling you to repentance for your sins and to put your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are wretched in our flesh. We are sinful. We have not been faithful to you as you've called us to be. And when we're truly honest with ourselves, we know that this is something that we cannot do in our own strength. What we need is someone else to come and to bear this for us in our place, and to help us with this for the rest of our lives. And what we find is the good news that Christ, your Son, takes on flesh so that He can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And through His death, by believing that He has paid off every sin that we have ever committed, and that His life and His death and His resurrection secures for us salvation, through faith we are saved. So I pray today that we would see again how Christ fits perfectly in the role of our Savior for sinners like us. Thank you for your willingness to suffer, even though you were innocent, and even though you were completely faithful, you died in our place. And now as we are saved, you've given us your spirit to help us in our weaknesses, to remain faithful until the end as you've called us to be. Help us, Father, to rely on the spirit, to recognize how desperately we need his help, and to be faithful to you. Help us, Father, to seek faithfulness over avoiding persecution, to seek faithfulness to you, no matter what the cost is, knowing that you have done everything for us and for our salvation. Father, thank you for this reminder, this sober reminder that we need you. And we look to you now, and we see Christ, and we know that you love us, you know that you've done all that we need. Help us to trust him in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.